Oh, there's another one. <laughs> I was dreaming to have my own home in Guam. I grow my breadfruit, I grow my banana, I grow my sweet potato, I grow my tapioca. Whatever I can uh, consume, I grow it. That's life, that's part of me, the soil. And uh, it reminds me in Chuk because uh, when uh, my grandmother was uh, telling me that, you have to take care of your land because you cannot survive on the on this island unless if you take care of the land. So that's why we consider uh, land is one of the very important in our life. We used to grow large-scale cucumbers, so my father had hired many laborers, particularly from Chuk. It was interesting because I knew that they were from a place not so far from my own, but I knew so little about them. But I sensed so many similarities and so many connections. So it sort of set me down this path to learning more about the region, learning more about other Pacific Islanders, and learning more about the relationship between the indigenous people of Guam, who are called Chamorros, and other Pacific Islanders. In 1986, this is when the Compact of Free Association was passed, and it allowed for open immigration from the Federated States of Micronesia into the United States and its territories, and that includes Guam. Shortly after the compact was signed, many Pacific Islanders came, especially from Chu, and they built extensions of their homes right here on Guam. <laughs> I came initially to find work and then stay to have an education for my kids. Since coming to Guam, many of us here in the community have found work. Yes. There have been thousands of others who've come to Guam. Some 300 of them live right near my dad's ranch, mostly from Chuk and Yap at the Gilbaza subdivision. In the early 1990s, a developer came in there and just literally carved it out in the middle of the jungle. And he subdivided it into quarter acre lots. So there are, I believe, 84 lots out there now. The residents came because it was affordable, very little down payment over something like 30 years. Nearly all of them have either moved from rental to rental apartments, or they've lived in low-income housing, or because Guam has so many destructive typhoons, many of them have a history of being temporarily homeless. So this is the first large-scale movement into land ownership. No landlord come and harass me come and tell me to take out part of my family because our house is just for how many people to stay inside. The land gives me freedom for my relative, for my family. I choose who have to come. I choose who have to go. That means I am the power on my land. Before we came out here, this place was all jungle. So my dad and my uncles and brothers uh, came out here and cleared this place so that we could move out from the rental. There's not a lot of infrastructure out there. Most of the houses are made of wood and tin. There are no paved roads, there's no cable, there's no telephone lines. It's interesting that the residents actually call it a ranch because tomorrow's think of a ranch as a place where you 
plant your roots, you grow your trees, you grow small crops for, you know, daily meals. It's a place where the extended family comes together. There's a lot of outdoor cooking. You know, you can play your music a little bit louder. And it's also just a place to relax. To be a non-owner on Guam, it really keeps me the sense of security. That means you have established your foothold in the community, on the land, on Guam, and you have the sense of belonging. And you have no way to be blown with the wind when it changes directions. We want justice! We want justice! Early in 2006, the Guam Environmental Protection Agency had learned about these growing subdivisions, and they served them with a notice of violation because they weren't properly hooked up to a sewer line, and they were threatened with evictions. EPA came in armed with a notice of eviction because of non-compliance. Every one of us received a notice because of the lack of infrastructures. What he promised us when we first buy this land, he promised us that uh, he will give us sure all the infrastructure, but until now, nothing. There is a law on Guam that states that if you live on a lot that's less than half an acre, that you have to be connected up to a public sewer. The key was a sewer. Because he didn't put the sewer in, all the other infrastructure did not follow. Concern of the community in Guam is we are living above the northern aquifer, the source of our water on Guam. The residents came in and there was no sewer line. So instead, they built either cesspools, which is essentially just sort of digging a hole, and septic tanks. So septic tanks are these large um, structures that are built underground that captures all this waste. But even though uh, many people in Guam build septic tanks. They have to be licensed by the government. Quickly, they started to gather, and that's when they decided to form this nonprofit called the United Pacific Islanders Corporation. And eventually, they filed a lawsuit against the subdivider. They were thinking we are crazy to go against such people with power, with money. Most of us in the, in the community have said, why we are being denied this service? And we are also taxpayer. Nobody should be denied a service by the government. But actually, I think it is a double standard. One of the reasons why the ranch is so special to them is because of what they've just come from. And finally, they come to a place where they can invite their relatives, where they can grow their own plants, plant their breadfruit trees, where they can literally build their own homes. It's in this sort of out of doors, open spaces that they socialize, where they come together as a unit, where they sort of do the daily task of either grading coconut or preparing for large groups of people. There are some lots, for example, where a brother might live with his family and a sister might live with her family, and there would be an outside kitchen where the two groups come together. Houses on Chu, just like in the Gilbaza, they're very functional, and they're always shifting because of the extended family, because people come in and out. At one moment, it could be an outside kitchen, and then the next month, it could be enclosed because a relative is coming to stay. There could be sort of like a living room space inside of the house. And because other family members come over, it could be a storage house the next. My house started with one single bedroom. When my daughter moved in, she don't have a place to stay, so I have to extend another bedroom. So I make another room, and my son move in my room. And I stay on the other side. And then my other son moved in. That is why there is a hallway, because the hallway is joining together the rooms. Ah! 
I really like living here on the ranch because we can build our, our outside kitchens. The outside kitchen makes it easier for us to move around, easier to prepare food, and we also like using the fire. The outside kitchen is also important to other women living here on the subdivision. Other women from Micronesia, they come together and chat. They also help each other prepare big meals. It's also a place to relax. <laughs> if they take this place from us, which we already stay on it, and we thought we have a good life. So urufuduk is something like when you stick or poke a knife into your uh, body, and you know when the take out the uh, the muscles or the meat, and I think it's very hard. We have house. And we they, have plants. They like have bread, uh, fruit. That feeling, <laughs> that pain. All That's this, how this tree it's gonna be describing ours. to how we gonna feel if they take this place from us. It's gonna be a very painful feeling to us. The constant worrying about the well-being of our kids, the possibility of relocating and start over again, and especially you know, there's just the older idea of being dislocated, you know. In order to avoid eviction, the residents decided that they would put portable toilets on their lots. The residents quickly took the portable toilets and they brought them to the back for some privacy. But the trucks that come out and pump these units couldn't reach to the back of the lot, so they had to bring them up in front again. And in many places in Micronesia, women are required to behave modestly around their brothers. So you can imagine how walking in front of everyone to go use the bathroom, how embarrassing that can be and how uncomfortable that can be. Every morning I have to get up and walk to the portable toilet. And it's near the road where everyone can see me, but sometimes, you know, it's embarrassing. At night I have to go there also and it's dark, there is no light. Imagine, raining, run. <laughs> you have to run. <laughs> and in the, in the afternoon, and the sun, sitting in there with the heat and the smell. Oh. It's just a horrible situation, and they've been doing this now for over six years. And they'll continue to use these portable toilets until the sewer line is put in the subdivision. Sometimes when other people see Pacific Islanders and big open spaces, it might seem chaotic at first. But oftentimes what's going on are groups of people who are coming together and trying to do it in a harmonious way. And one of the ways they can do it is through the use of the traditional skirts. The skirts become a way for women to move and maneuver around men in a respectful way. The skirt also has a lot of significance in my culture. It allows me to show respect to the men, especially my brothers, because it covers up my legs and my thighs. It's easy to move around, and I can put it on quickly, on and off, you know. I can wear my skirt to shower, sleep, or swim in the ocean. I can pull it over my chest on a hot day when I'm in my house, when I'm in the kitchen preparing food, or when I'm cleaning outside.
traveled to Chuuk several times. Much of it has to do with the relationships that I have with the people in Chuuk, and especially my relationship with Kathy, who was my promised sister. There are many places throughout Micronesia where they have these relationships called promised brother and promised sister. And this is when two individuals come together who are not blood related, and yet they promise to love and to take care of each other. These can be lifelong relationships as long as the two reciprocate with each other. And of course, over time, the families become involved and they also reciprocate with each other. So Lona, she's my promised sister. And when I'm in Guam, she would take me to her family house and I would take her to my family place. Lona will come to Chuk and I will bring her out here. And so the culture continue. Her family is my family and my family is her family. Of course, we are not both Chukis. She's tomorrow, I'm, I'm Chukis. are our graves. This one is my niece, and this is my uncle. And next to him is my grandma. When we put our graves next to our house, it makes us feel that they are still present. The kids like to take their food and come on the graves and eat. And they would jump from one grave to another grave. And they feel that it's a place for them to play. I'm still connected to the land in Juk, especially through my older sister, Florence. She is my connection to the land, especially to my parents. Although they are no longer living, but they are buried on the land there where my sister stays. Even though I'm further away thousand miles from Juke, I still have the connection to my parents, to the land, through my sister. When people talk about a clan that is thriving, it has a lot to do with the relationship between a firstborn son and a firstborn daughter. Because a firstborn son is like the spokesperson for the clan and he's the protector of his sisters. Even if, for example, Joshua living on Guam, he continues to make major decisions. The responsibility of the firstborn son is got to protect the family, make sure the family well-being is the priority. The firstborn daughter also plays, uh, has a lot of responsibility because in most places in Micronesia, um, Land is passed through women. They manage the entire family assets. So even though I am responsible, but yeah, she is in charge. There was one evening where I was sitting down with Joshua and he had told me this story about he and his oldest sister, that they had gotten into a fight about land that she had given away without his permission. This land, it's now belong to the uh, daughters of the three sisters of my, my father. Even though I'm the Finiji or the first born daughter of my family, but it's also the Maniji. It should be also consulted. Then I explained to him why I went hired without consulting him. After a long years of thinking about it, I came to believe that the bonds between the brother and the sisters, it's more vital for the well-being of the entire family than a piece of land. So I apologize for my mistake. Like I said, if I, won, if I couldn't redo it again, I would do it in a better way.
Topping things off for you tonight, residents of the Gilbaza subdivision have cause to celebrate and to worry as Judge Anita Sokola has finally decided how the court battle with the developer Cypher Limited will end. In her 37-page decision, Sokola notes that $580,000 will be awarded to residents for Seifert's failure to install a sewer line in the subdivision. In addition, Sokola says residents are now responsible for installing the sewer line with the money from the judgment. Going to court, even just entering the courtroom, we have the feeling of fear. First, you know, there is the guard at the door. What if they think that we did something wrong? And and because, you know, we're all uh, Micronesians going to that courtroom and how they would see us and how Micronesians have been uh, featured on Guam. Before I did not go to court, it's like I'm on a boat floating in the water, in the middle of the sea. I tried my best to scream. Nobody listened to me. Nobody can help me. In the courtroom, when they have to call the members of our community to go up on the stand, that's like a fear. Would they say the right thing, the right answer to their question? Would they be able to go through and make it on that stand? But as they educated themselves about the case itself, about what their rights were, they became more confident. I think they would describe this as a journey because the manner in which they found each other and they got organized and they found a lawyer and they went to court, you know, that whole process, it's like finding their voice, but also discovering each other. I want uh, everybody to see us, uh, how we uh, struggle here. I want them to come and uh, see us so we can uh, exchange our uh, understanding of each other. Up until that point, we had received so much bad publicity and they thought it was time for the larger Guam to come in and see what it really was like in the community, that they really were growing their roots, that they were, you know, planting breadfruit, they were harvesting from their trees already. Come on over with the plate. Hi. You want to try? Please come on and taste the Hollywood breadfruit. They were being productive people, that they had built their homes, and that they had much to offer and exchange with the larger Guam. And they wanted to do this through food. What gets printed in the newspaper is one thing, but how people are really reacting to their case, I mean, they were behind them and they were telling them, you know, good for you, you go for it. I think they were surprised to hear that. There's never been a time when a group of families in Gilbaza came together to do something like this. And we can see all of you coming around to support us. Now you have restored the smile and the happiness in our hearts. It's been over 20 years since the Compact of Free Association and the Micronesian community on Guam. They've been part of uh, the wider community through work, education, and church community. Those that they work, they pay taxes. Those that they join the church community, they put in the money. So that's going to the church. The kids going to school from Head Start to high school. And there are a couple numbers of kids in college. So they're part of the community on Guam too. My dad was very excited about planting the first breadfruit tree on this lot. But today, 
Look at it now, the tree is big. Uh, we were eating from the tree, and um, even people who are still living in the apartment, they also came out here and, you know, take breadfruit from the tree. Terianaiturura, that means uh, a place of your uh, interest, a place where you, you like to stay, that you have interest with comfort, security, and all that uh, that make you feel better. <laughs>